After four years and nine courses, as I walked into the contemplative practitioner that cold January evening, I knew this would be the last leg of my Master's of Education journey. I was toying with the idea of switching to the Multimodal Literacies course. It seemed to align with all my passions and interests. An easy way to end. But I thought I needed to end this educational journey with a challenge. And a challenge it has been. This journey has pushed me out of my comfort zone and forced me to face issues I have long pushed aside. Along my MED journey, I have found that ideas and concepts have arisen at just the right time. They have collided with my everyday conversations about change, technology, the future of education. I felt that just the right time feeling once again in this course, but this time it was a little different. There have been many moments this past year where I just felt off and I could never really pinpoint why. Nothing substantial had changed, but it felt like dark clouds kept creeping in. This time, I wasn't struggling with pedagogical concerns, but rather matters of the soul. One of our earliest conversations in the course was about the difference between contemplation and reflection. To be honest, I never really considered the difference. There are words usually blurred together in education training, reminding us to consider our actions in the classroom. But as we explored the two concepts, I could, suddenly could see the dividing line. I'm really good at reflecting, maybe to a fault. Thinking back on what I have done, residing in my head, stewing over what I could do better, all things I have perfected. Contemplation, on the other hand, terrified me. Being present and still, not doing, sitting back and being, are not comfortable. The need for balance was pretty apparent. What was holding me back from contemplation? Maybe I just needed to hone the skill and exercise contemplation regularly. If you ask people about me, you probably, or hopefully, would get that I am passionate about teaching and learning. I have wanted to be an educator since I was six, and that was it. I never had a backup plan. This was always a vocation for me. If you ask those same people, they may also tell you I'm a bit of a busy bee. Some would say a workaholic. Constantly doing, a bit of a Martha, trying to think of the next steps. Being a busy bee never seemed like a bad thing because it linked back to my passion and vocation. How could that be bad? If you ask my family and friends, they would also tell you I'm a worry wart. Stewing over past choices and overthinking the steps ahead has become the norm. When most people let go and move on, I'm still clinging on. It feels like my brain is always switched on. The voice is taking over one by one. It is one of the reasons I enjoyed Dan Harris's book so much, because it felt like he understood me. As he described his tendency to jump to the worst-case scenario, I found myself nodding. When he described the voices in his head, the evil puppeteer taking control, the untamable monkey mind, I saw myself in his story. As we have explored mindfulness, the phrase that keeps blaring at me is reciting not in the past or future, but in the present. From Dan Harris's story, I could see that the dark clouds I was sensing had perhaps been my own doing. I let the voices in my head take over. I let the busy bee and worrywart call shotgun. The idea of me reaching a moment of Zen seemed impossible. It is one of the reasons I enjoyed our exploration of the contemplatives, seeing that each of their journeys was not as straightforward as we might think. It was a struggle. It took time and required them to make choices daily. The messy journey was comforting. I love St. Teresa of Avila's story. She seemed real, tangible. When I read her words about a madman in her head, my struggles with the daily meditation seemed a little more bearable. If she struggled, then maybe I wasn't doing it all wrong. Because as I sat in my chair and meditated daily, I definitely felt like I was doing something wrong. I could see the need for mindfulness in my practice, but how was I going to pause and focus? Meditating in my chair in the early morning didn't seem to be getting me there fast enough. Early on in the course, we discussed the invisible world and matters of the soul. That night, I walked away with several sketch notes as Jim shared. I kept going back to one that focused on nurturing the soul. We discussed the many elements from the mysterious, the need for a sense of purpose or vocation, and connections to people, places, and communities. It was here that I realized that small changes in those connections may have been the tipping point this year. The busy bee and worrywart in me took advantage of the cracks. To the outsider, they were all small and significant moves. Nothing for anyone to complain about. But the shift they caused created that crack that allowed the dark clouds to push in. Suddenly, years of bad habits seemed to catch up with me. That night, Jack posed a question. What makes your soul sing? What makes your soul sing? Seems simple enough. I started thinking of the moments. The laughter of a child, a learner's grin after struggling towards success being in nature, time with family, cooking and baking, creating without constraints. Naming them wasn't difficult. Making the time to do them was another story. I realized that I often relegated things that make my soul sing to after work time. After my to-do list was complete, after I made it through the gridlock of daily tasks, 
I relied on my daily job to provide those moments, but realized I hadn't given myself permission to stop and pause. So it seemed simple. Give myself the permission to stop, pause, and be. Time to practice. I went to the lake. It was a beautiful sunny day, but I had to talk myself into it as I was supposed to be writing a paper. Something about sunshine and water makes being mindful just that much easier. As I stood by the lake's edge, the colors painted the sky and the birds flittered about. It was hard not to be present, to not worry about the past or the future, but just to be. I find those moments are the most humbling. At one hand, they remind you how what powerful and amazing the world is and your role in it. And on the other, they remind you how small of a role you really play in the grander picture. I think it is in moments like these that I am most at peace with myself. The voices in my head subside and I feel connected to my creator. I realize I am not in control and that's okay. As we have explored mindfulness, I could see how such a brief moment could reset my soul for the days ahead. So as this journey comes to an end, I now know I need to stop, pause, and be. Sitting meditation may not be the tool that helps me become mindful, but there are many other strategies that can help me keep my soul strong. I know patience will be needed. I will have to remind myself not to let ego creep in, get mad that it's not happening fast enough or worrying about comparing my journey to that of others. Although I know where I need to go, the story has just begun. The key takeaway, to fuel my passion for education, to help others, to lead, I need to balance reflection with contemplation. I need to pause and be mindful for my soul's sake. Thanks for listening.